I'm Aaron Graber with Ventrac, and in this video, we're going to go over the 4520. This is going to be an operational intro, but it should be useful to even seasoned operators who might pick up a few tips and tricks. We're going to go over this machine front to back and give you all of the information you need to get started running a Ventrac 4520. This will also be useful information for 4500s and prior machines. Some of the specific locations of components might be slightly different, but from a functional platform standpoint, they're very, very similar, and this should come into play for all of your Ventrac fleet. So I've got my list here. We're going to run down through this whole thing. Uh, believe it or not, this small piece of paper will take me maybe an hour to talk through. So buckle up. We're going to get into some of the nitty gritty on how to run this thing. Uh, one caveat, we're not going to go super deep into, at a technical level into anything. So all of the service points and, and deep into the machine, stuff that you have to know to maintain it, uh, that sort of thing, uh, that's, a, that's a different video, and you can find that in your owner's manual. But we're going to basically just discuss what it takes to get on this machine, either as a new operator or someone with a little bit of time, and run it. This video is inspired by all of the customer comments and questions that we get uh, here at the factory and through our dealer network about very specific things on the machine. How do I deal with traction loss? Uh, what happens when my machine feels like it's not moving right? Uh, just little things like that uh, that we can hopefully help give some, some education on uh, so that you're really well equipped to run this machine. All right, the first thing I want to touch on is a little bit of product training. So bear with me while I go through this. Uh, this is a platform that is universal across our entire line. So what you need to know is whether you have a K, P, Y, Z, or N, all of your 4520s are largely the same machine. So mostly the difference is in the engine. This happens to be an N, which is the Kubota EFI gas model. Um, but all the rest of them will share similar controls and layout for all the things that are important for this discussion. So while those tractors are different, they all work very similarly and they apply to the same principles. More than likely, you've seen a Ventrac in a lot of different situations. And whether that's winter snow removal or working on a golf course or anything in between, uh, whatever attachment is on the, on the machine, it is the same machine. So the tractor itself is the same. The platform's identical. They all use the same attachments in the 4000 series. Um, and all of those other configurations are just ad adaptations to the base machine. So let's dive right into this. And we're going to start with the attachments. And the first thing I want to talk about is hitch arms. So we're actually going to point the camera the other direction here. And we've got a prop over here. And we're going to talk about hitch arms from the tractor side to the attachment. So what I've got is the tractor side hitch arm here, and this is just a component off of the machine, but this is what it looks like, and it's good to get this up close in person, and we wanted to do this just me holding it so that you can really see what's going on here. Basically, the way we run all of our front-mounted attachments is they connect, this is tractor side again, they connect using these uh, beams into the attachment and then these latches over the hooks. So what I'm gonna do is show you how that happens here and without the machine in the way, this would be a little easier to see. So basically, you get the, the tractor lined up, and you slide it in here. And once you are far enough forward, then you use the tractor to latch those hooks. That is connecting an attachment. And then we'll go over PTO. You've got some other stuff there, too. But what's important to look at when you see this is right up in here, if you want to get closer with the camera, how this nests together, because this will teach you a lot about how to actually get into the attachment. So that's point number one. One of the most common things we get asked about is, I'm having trouble connecting to attachments. Uh, Aaron, how do you make it look so easy? How can you do it in 30 seconds like you do? And most of it is understanding how this fits together. So I'm going to back this off again, and we'll talk about it separated now. So you can see these pieces slide in here, and this is just an example of an attachment. They're all going to be roughly the same. There is a bottom and top part that that piece needs to slide into. And this piece here on the front side is kind of like a glide rail. So you'll want to get this, I'm going to back it off and just go the other direction so you can see. You'll want to get this as parallel to that glide rail as possible so that as you slide it forward, it can make its way into that pocket. And if you keep in mind how those two pieces are actually formed, That'll give you a, a great advantage connecting to the attachment itself. So now that you've seen how the attachment uh, actually connects via hitch arms, it's good to know a couple uh, pro tips on actually driving into those attachments. So if the attachment has wheels on it, and especially if it has a roller on the back like many of our mowing decks, it may want to roll forward if it's on a flat shop floor. So always block your attachments or put them up against something to, to connect them. It'll make it easier. 
Um, the next thing is some of our attachments have kickstands or various depths that the cylinders need to be adjusted to so that the hitch arms are level. So you want the, the hitch arms on the attachment side to be level to the ground at, a, at a, a rough height that makes it appropriate to drive the tractor into. And then one of the things that I like to make sure I recommend to people is to have weight transfer off. We'll talk about weight transfer in more detail here in a little bit, but make sure that weight transfer is off when you're connecting or disconnecting from attachments because it makes it much easier to control the hitch arms on the tractor that way and uh, just makes it easier to get in and out of attachments. The next thing once you're actually physically connected to the attachment is to finish up connecting all of the different parts to make it work. So the reason we have a power rake here on this unit is because it showcases all of the different circuits that we have available on the 4520. And the first thing you wanna do is connect the PTO. So this right here is the PTO lever. This belt lives on the attachment and each one of them each one of the attachments has a belt of a certain size. It'll slide over this pulley when, the, when it's detensioned, and then you'll just push this down. One thing to pay attention to is the actual force that it takes to push this lever in once the belt is connected. So you'll see here, it, it takes a little bit of force for me to do. It's pretty easy, but then it kind of snaps into place and, and um, it has a little bit of tension there that doesn't want to let it pop out all by itself. And that's in the appropriate place but if you start to notice this get too loose or too tight, then you'll wanna make some adjustment to that PTO. Uh, and the way to do that is back behind here, there's a couple bolts you have to manipulate. Uh, that procedure is in the operator's manual. We're not gonna go into that for this video, but just know that it is there and sometimes does require that adjustment. Where that is important is if you are suffering from uh, shortened belt life, that can be one of the culprits. So if you don't have enough tension on that belt, then it can be slipping and shortening the life of your belts tremendously. Another important point of note in this area of the tractor and regarding the PTO, so there's two belts here to be worried about, uh, the one on the attachment and the one on the tractor side. The one on the tractor side is a service item that will be uh, replaced periodically. And to access that, you just take this little panel off on the front of the machine. On the 4520, it's right here in the front, but going behind this area is where you would get to that belt uh, to check it for the uh, what kind of condition it's in and uh, replace it if necessary. That is something that you should check periodically just to understand where it is in its life cycle. Uh, you never wanna get stranded, but if you do get stranded, having a spare is also helpful too. So uh, making sure that you have a couple spare items is always prudent. Uh, and that's one of those things that you should pay attention to. Okay, now the attachment is almost completely connected. We'll come over to this side and we'll connect the hydraulics. They're already done here for me on this one, uh, but you'll see largely this exact same setup on most of our attachments. Some have two hydraulics, some have four. Some also have an additional 12 volt plug. The tractor comes standard with two hydraulic outlets. It can be upgraded with an extra kit to this system here where you have four hydraulic circuits. And we do have an additional kit that makes a total of six hydraulic outlets. You can also upgrade it to a 12 volt. Um, those are exclusive. You can do one or the other or both. In this case, we have both just to show everything that can, is possible. Um, what's important here is the color codes need to match. So you'll see yellow, red, uh, those are actually the standard colors. And then the additional would be the white on top and black on the bottom. Just match your hoses up accordingly. That way the movements of the attachment happen the way we design them to. If these are hard to connect, there are a couple videos online. We actually made one ourselves that you can watch to see how to, to remedy that situation but typically it means that there is pressure built up on either the tractor or attachment side. If it's the attachment side, the long and the short of it is you have to relieve that pressure physically. There's a few different ways to go about that. Again, watch those videos, uh, but it's pretty easy to do in the field if you need to in, in a snap. On the tractor side, the way to remedy that situation is actually very easy. What you wanna do is turn the tractor off, but make sure the key is on the accessory position so it has power, and you'll wanna move this lever left and right, the small SDLA lever, both with the button depressed and not. And that will relieve all of the pressure in both of those hydraulic circuits uh, and allow you to connect those lines. It's also good practice to do that as part of your disconnection process. So if I get done using this attachment and I set it on the ground, I don't just wanna release these hydraulic lines without doing anything with the machine still running because it will leave pressure trapped and make it harder for me to get back into it later. So what I wanna do is that same thing that I just talked about. Turn the tractor off, relieve all that pressure, then disconnect these, and then turn the tractor back on to disconnect the attachment. So it adds a little bit of time, 
uh, to do it that way, but it saves you long, long term in uh, the ability to get back into those attachments later. All right, so now you've got your attachment connected to the machine and you're ready to do some work. Let's get to the meat of this, which is the controls of the tractor. How do you make this machine go? So the first thing to talk about, and we're kind of listing these in not necessarily the order you would use them on a day-to-day -day basis, but in terms of priority for knowing. Um, so we'll go over everything, but the most important thing is understanding the float position. So this right here is your drive control. This is your SDLA is what we call it because it stands for speed, direction, lift, and auxiliary. Uh, this machine is controlled exclusively by this handle and the steering wheel. So this is your forward and reverse. So this would be forward, this would be reverse, but you also use this to lift and to lower attachments. And then your accessory lever here changes the angle or dumps with a bucket or something like that. So it's the additional hydraulic functionality of the attachment. What's really important though is float, like I said. So if you push this lever to the right, it'll lower the attachment. But then if you push it all the way past a detent right there, you can feel there's a physical catch. So you push up against it and then it goes right past. And if you're in that detent, then that is float. And what that does is it lets the hitch arms of the tractor follow the contour of the ground so the attachment rides along the ground. Of course, with a front mounted machine, this is very, very important for anything like a mower deck uh, or something that's ground engaging, like a tiller, a uh, power rake, anytime you're working on the ground surface. If you don't do this and you run this not in float, let's say in a mower deck, and it's just, it sounds a little crazy, but I have seen this. Somebody's using a mower deck without this in float, then what's gonna happen is you could drive across a little raise in the ground and your tires of the tractor might raise up a little bit. Well, in this position, the hitch arms are locked rigid. So what it's gonna do is lift that deck off the ground slightly. So you might think you're mowing along pretty evenly, but then you'll step back and you'll get a glance of the whole property and you'll notice waves where it's like, ah, why isn't that tracking? And that's because you're not in float. Float is also very critical for maintaining traction if you're in difficult terrain. So again, Know when to use float, get very familiar with float, make sure every operator that's ever gonna be on the machine understands float and uses it. So we're gonna stay here at the drive lever for a moment and talk about just the extended use of it. You'll also notice some buttons here. These are optional kits that are related to the secondary hydraulic function and the 12 volt function as well. If this tractor was bone stock, then there would just be knobs here. There wouldn't be any of these extra controls. So that is an option. Your tractor may or may not have this. If it does, what you control with these extra buttons is as such. This red switch changes from one circuit to another with the 12 volt. These buttons, the orange and yellow, are for uh, 12 volt actuators. So like on a snow blower chute where you're con controlling the pitch of the snow blower, uh, or like on this power rake actually, there's an actuator for controlling the hydraulic speed of the drum. That's gonna be done using these buttons. And uh, you'll notice that those are used in anything that has a variable hydraulic application. On the back, we have an additional green button that is the option. And what that does is change from one hydraulic circuit to the next. So on the power rake, the example here would be if I move this lever to the right and left, the drum will turn left and right, pretty logical. If I hold the green button down and do the same thing, then the drum will raise and lower the depth. So this gives you all of your, your advanced control all in one spot. Um, as far as its primary function, driving in the machine forward and reverse, you drive forward like this, you drive back like this. This machine is not equipped with a foot pedal, but if it was, it would be mounted right in these two holes and it would work in conjunction with this lever. So it would be physically tied. If I press the foot, foot pedal, then this lever would be going forward as well. And if I use this hand control, then the foot pedal is moving. The reason we offer a foot pedal is for operator preference. There's a few situations, especially like with a ballpark groomer or a vac system where you wanna be driving forward but using your hand for rear controls. Uh, and so that's nice to have as kind of a cruise control setup. But the foot pedal is not the primary mode of using our machine. Sometimes we'll catch operators using the foot pedal uh, exclusively and most of them don't really like it that much. They'll, they'll talk about, hey, it's kind of finicky to use. You know, I don't really have like as much control as I would want. And if we can get them to switch to using the hand control, they change their mind instantly. It's like, oh, that makes way more sense. So the foot pedal, while it's an option we offer and it is useful for some situations, 
I would never recommend using it primarily because you have a lot better control on a tractor, uh, even just any tractor, using your hands uh, than you do your feet. So, but the foot pedal is available and works with these controls. Another thing to mention on the control area, one of the things that we get requests for a lot is my hand control here is just really hard to move. I don't understand why it's so hard to move. And as you can tell, like, it's not hard for me at all right now. Um, and that is for a specific reason. So you'll see this lever down here. This is an operator assist lever. So if you change the position of this lever, it gives it a much stiffer return to neutral. So this is harder to push. And that's really more of a training mode. So like if you have it in this position, if I am driving forward in the machine and I just let go, it brings that, that lever back pretty swiftly. But what that means is if I'm trying to operate the machine, then I'm doing a lot of heavy lifting here because I'm pushing really hard. So once I'm comfortable with the machine and I understand how it works, I take it out of that operator assist mode and it's much easier to control here. And in fact, when the machine's off, you'll see the lever stays. If the machine was running, it would draw back to neutral. It would just do it much slower than the other position. So the point is, if this is really stiff and hard to move, check where this lever is. Continuing on the operator controls at the dash level, we'll just go over all the different things you'll need to know. So this is your parking brake right here. Uh, this needs to be engaged to start the machine, and it needs to be disengaged to operate and run the machine. If you ever get into a pickle uh, and something makes you nervous and you just want to stop, this is in a convenient located position, just like an automotive handbrake style, grab it and pull it. That will stop the machine in its tracks and it will return the drive levers to the neutral range. This area down here is the attachment clasp. So this closes the hooks on the attachment. We talked about earlier those, those hooks that close over that pin. That's what this lever does here. So this is uh, closed all the time while you're operating and then you just use this when you're removing attachments. So there is a, a lever here that keeps it from sliding over. So you must depress that and then move this over. If you try to do it without doing that, it'll just get stopped here. And that's to make sure it doesn't ever accidentally come off and disconnect the attachment. So you move this over, then lift up. So pro tip on that lever, if it's too stiff to close, uh, but it looks like you're in the attachment, you probably aren't all the way in. You might be 99% of the way. Uh, if those hooks are just barely contacting that pin and there's got a little, a little bit of friction there, then that lever can, can kind of want to close, but it just be really stiff. So if it feels that way, it shouldn't. Just keep going a little bit further into the attachment, and then once it clears, it'll go down no problem. Okay, right next to the drive lever, we have the additional controls for PTO and rear hydraulics. So these three levers run the rear hydraulic setup. That is an option, so your tractor may not have these, but if it does, that's what they control. Uh, this raises and lowers the hitch arms and actuates the two hydraulic circuits that are back there. This is your tractor PTO, so engage, disengage, right in a convenient spot so you can hit it if you need to to stop it. Last part's over here. You've got your headlights, work lights, areas for other lighting kits, cup holder, and then your USB charge point for if you need to charge any small devices. All right, coming to the other side of the control panel, uh, we can start with the steering wheel. This kind of goes without saying, it's pretty basic. There's nothing to really know here. Other than this is an infinite loop, I guess, maybe that's the way to describe it. So it doesn't necessarily, as you, as you can tell, like, while the machine's off, I can turn this, and now my Ventrac logo <laughs> isn't upright. So if your Ventrac logo isn't perfectly upright, it doesn't mean anything's wrong with the system, just that's what happens after using it. Uh, so just know that that's not an issue. Um, another thing on the parking brake, there is a sensor related to the parking brake. So that sensor is acting to know when the parking brake is engaged and disengaged and either letting or not letting you start the machine or run the machine. So if you're having trouble with the machine starting, PTO is off, still not getting anything, make sure that you are engaged far enough on this parking brake. Um, and if you do isolate it to this parking brake area as causing an issue with the machine not running or something, then you can adjust where that sensor engages. So again, it's in the manual, look, look deeper into those things if you need to, but just know that that is a possibility uh, from a safety standpoint. We make sure that when the, when the machine uh, recognizes that the parking brake is not on, it can't be started. Okay. 
Next would be the gauge in front of the steering wheel. I'm just gonna turn the key on just enough to light it up so you can see. This shows all of your vitals. So you can see this tractor has 1.7 hours on it. Ooh, lucky us, brand new one. Uh, RPM, this is important for knowing which attachment you have on. Uh, certain attachments need to run at high RPM. Others can run at lower RPMs. It doesn't, you know, doesn't really, there's no rule for everything across the board. Uh, and not everything is full RPM all the time. So read the operator's manuals on the attachments and figure out where they need to be and then match it using the RPM. Uh, shows also your temperature and your fuel level. And then some of the lights that you saw initially on startup uh, here, you can see temperature lights, battery lights, low fuel warning, that sort of thing. Um, and those indicators will come on at the appropriate times. So very, very similar diagnostic to anything else with a gauge like that. This is your throttle. So this controls on this engine, it's EFI. So this is not like a direct link cable or anything. It's just position sensitive. But here you can see the turtle and the rabbit. This isn't actually speed of the machine because that would really be more like how far the lever is pushed. But this is how much your engine throttle is. So this is controlling your RPM, your engine RPM. And because we have a hydraulic drivetrain and the way that it's put together, your RPM dictates how fast the machine can go. So if I'm only at half RPM and full stick, then I'm only getting half speed, essentially. Uh, if I'm at full RPM, I can be crawling and barely moving the tractor if I'm just barely moving this lever. So these work in tandem, uh, but again, this is just controlling engine RPM. This is your key, pretty basic there, just and there's an accessory spot and a run. And then down here, this is a pretty important part. This is where you change from high to low range. So you'll notice now we're in high range here. Low range would be pushed all the way forward. We have this safety pin here to keep anything from coming undone. You pull the safety pin, move this lever over, and then push it down to engage to another range. Uh, in between those, and this is also very important, is neutral. You'll see that little N right there. If this machine ever has to be pushed, pulled, towed, unstuck from a giant bog where you were working, uh, make sure it's in neutral. That will avoid doing any damage to the hydraulic components or the transaxles. We do get a lot of questions about high and low range. When should I be in high range? When should I be in low range? Um, and most of the time, the task will dictate that for you. You'll notice that if you're in high range and the tractor just doesn't have that same torque that you're used to, then you're probably in an application that's too demanding and you need to switch to low range. You'll also notice that sometimes if you're in low range and just like driving around, and you're not loading the machine a whole lot, and it's on a, a pretty smooth surface or something that you could easily be going faster. So let that be the leading indicator for you, uh, what the tractor is doing. But until you get that seat time to understand it, the, the general guidance that I and we would give is that use high range for transport and material moving. So if you're doing mulch jobs, moving some stone around, driving from point to point, that sort of thing, um, and then use low range for any heavy work. So if you're engaging the ground with anything, if you're climbing a hill, if you are uh, working in wet conditions, anything where you feel like the tractor is doing a lot of work, low range is probably where you need to be. Okay, lastly on operator controls, the seat. So I am in our suspension seat, this is an option, and you can see the adjustment here, this adjustment, you push it down or pull it up to add or remove tension from the seat and that gives you a little more or less bounce. The standard seat is also pretty comfortable, but both of them will have an adjustment for fore and aft. So you pull this lever and you can slide the seat all the way forward or all the way back. As you can see, all the way forward, we do accommodate a pretty good size range of operators. This is way too close for me. My knees are too far into the dash, so I always run it a little bit further back. Um, but that's an accommodation you can make for operator differences. Another thing, talking about operator ergonomics, that you can change, we have a raised platform that uh, basically closes this gap here. So my foot would naturally sit right here, but I've got pretty long legs. If you're a shorter operator, we do sell raised platforms that put your foot right here in line with the center tunnel of the machine. We also have foot pegs, and these are really useful for working on hillsides. If you're driving down a hill, especially, you're gonna dig into here and your feet will rest on these foot pegs and give you a little bit more stability. These foot pegs also have two positions. So you can get to this bolt behind here, take it out and raise or lower these foot pegs to again, tune it to the operator's preferences.
So in summary, operating this machine, although I just went through a whole bunch of details, is very simple. Once you understand all of those little particulars, the minutes that will be passing by as you're working will only be consumed by this. So it's, it's very simple. It's I'm looking forward, eyes ahead on what the attachment is doing. I've got one hand on the steering wheel, one hand on the SDLA control lever, and I'm driving forward and reverse, using this to control the attachment, and everything else is just static around me. Next, it's really important that you understand all of the variables that can play into the performance of the machine. And some of them are hyper, hyper critical. The first one being tire pressure. This one is huge, absolutely massive. Uh, so before we do that, we're gonna go on a detour and I'm gonna beat the read your stickers and read your manuals drum for a second. And I'll point to this sticker here in the center tunnel of the machine. Um, oh, by the way, we also have our serial plate here. So this shows you the serial number of the tractor. If you ever have any service issues and you have to talk to a dealer or us, that number is what you're gonna to wanna to reference so we know exactly what machine you're working with. But over here, this sticker shows you a few different warnings and a few different pieces of information. But one of the things it shows is tire pressure. And you'll notice that there's two separate boxes here, single wheels and dual wheels. Single wheels, we spec eight to 16 PSI, while dual wheels is different. So we say eight to 10 PSI for the inners and six to eight for the outers. I want to reiterate, tire pressure is massively important. So after looking at that chart, you'll notice there's a lot to digest there. We have a pretty large range using single wheels, eight to 16. That's starting with eight and then doubling it. You're gonna notice that that 16 PSI only really comes into play if you're working with very heavy attachments on the front and or back end that's making the tires squat too much. Or if you're running a cab um, and you're working mostly on hard surfaces and it doesn't matter. But when you're working on turf and if traction is important to you, then you're gonna to wanna to get as close as you possibly can to that low recommendation number. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna improve traction and make the tractor handle a little bit better. Oftentimes we will get calls or requests for, uh, you know, tractor performance on a hillside not being as good as they thought it could be. And usually what it comes down to is people are running too high of pressure in their tires. Now, with dual wheels, it gets even more complicated because we're specking two separate pressure ratings. But if you wanna simplify the conversation about dual wheels and the pressure you should be running, there is one option that falls technically within our spec range and is easy to remember. If there's eight tires on the machine, eight PSI in all of them. So that's not ideal because ideal would be running six PSI in the outers and that gives you the best possible traction. But if you just put eight in all of them, you'll be okay with tire pressure and it'll be something that's easily remembered, easily checked, especially if you're doing daily inspections to make sure tire pressure is right where it needs to be, that sort of thing. All right, we're gonna take a slight detour from all of the operational things that are critical and talk about just tires for now since we're on that topic. We get a lot of questions about tire options and what tires should I buy, how should I configure them. Here's the, the quick summary if you just wanna skip past this section and not learn anymore. Stick to the all-terrain field tracks tires and those are good. Those are good for nearly every application. Now, here's the extended cut. We have turf tires and field tracks tires available. These are the field tracks. These are what comes standard on each machine. Turf tires are obviously that, turf tires. They're a little less aggressive with the tread pattern, um, preferred in some really delicate applications by some people. But at the end of the day, our machine does an incredible job of protecting the turf underneath because of the flex frame that you don't really need turf tires on this machine. And because these tires are, are soft and pliable enough to not do really any, any serious damage. They actually end up doing better in some cases at protecting the turf because they're less likely to break traction. So I always recommend to stick to the field tracks. Uh, we spec or as original equipment standard what works the best anyway. So stick to it uh, unless you're in one of those applications that just absolutely demands having to have turf tires for protocol sake. So that is an option. You can do turf tires, uh, but mm, whether the benefit is there or not is, is not usually the case for most customers. Another thing we offer is tire chains. Now it's a third tire option because it's actually a smaller tire. You can do this one of two ways. You can run a tire chain combo on the outer dual only on all four corners and leave these standard tires on, or you can take these tires off, 
replace them with the smaller tires that are suitable for the additional chains and run chains on all four corners with both duels. The chains are meant for those really aggressive situations where you're taking care of really rough terrain, uh, lots of aggressive hills, and traction is an absolute must have. They just do a little bit better at getting traction. And my personal recommendation would be that you wanna get chains on all four corners, inner and outer, if you're gonna go that way. If it's worth doing chains, it's worth doing all around. And in that case, you're gonna want them on all uh, wheels of the, of the tractor. The reason those actually go to a smaller tire is because the clearance between the fender and the tire is too tight to just throw chains on these, these standard tires. So that's why they go to a totally different setup and it's why you have to change them completely out if you're gonna go all around on all eight tires. Okay, the next thing about tires is probably the most important thing is just dual wheels and their existence, what they're useful for, why we have them. We talked a little bit about them already, talking about tire pressure, but you can get dual wheels there. So each tractor comes standard with only four. You can add dual wheels later and it's a pretty simple install. What it does is adds a second hub and that extends out and then that tire can thread onto that hub so you just have them side by side. That's why all of our tires have dual valve stems. You'll see valve stems on the inner and outer of the tire. It's so that once you put that dual wheel on, you still have access to a valve stem on the inside tire from the inside. And uh, doing that process takes a few minutes on each corner. So it's something that can come on and off pretty easily. So if you have dual wheels on the machine and you wanna go to single wheels for access or uh, just weight or trailering or any, any reasons at all. Uh, just know that it is a pretty simple process to do, uh, to add those or to take them away. And lastly, about duels, why you would want them in the first place. They are absolutely imperative for some of the applications of our machine. Having dual wheels makes the tractor more stable and it amplifies the slope rating. So dual wheels are what give the tractor the ability to operate on 30 degree hills. Without the dual wheels, if you're operating on, on single wheels only, the tractor's only rated for 20 degrees in any direction. A very critical point if you are running dual wheels is to make sure that your torque settings are right and they are torqued down. Occasionally we have seen a dual wheel come off if it was installed improperly. And what you need to make sure you're doing there is make sure the lugs on, on the wheels themselves are tightened to 55 foot pounds and the draw bolt that holds the whole dual wheel assembly on each corner is torqued down to 120 foot-pounds. Check it periodically, make sure it stays there, uh, but that's very critical to make sure you use dual wheels properly. The next thing I wanna highlight is the sealant that we offer for our tires. So we spec these tires specifically for the rubber compound, the sidewall flex, everything about them gives them the right performance that we want out of the machine. But because we've chosen a few aspects of the tires, uh, we've given up the ability for them to be bulletproof. Um, so they're not fully solid, they're not foam filled, uh, they're not like construction tires that have sidewalls that are, are ridiculously thick. And for that reason, uh, we run an internal tire sealant in applications where you might face flat tires. So we sell it here at Ventrac and get it through your local dealer, they can install it for you, uh, or you can order it from them and get it in. It's a very heavy du duty, military grade Kevlar infused sealant and it basically takes the tires that uh, are kind of standard turf industry tires and turns them into construction grade in application, lets them operate in conditions that otherwise would shred uh, standard tires like this. And so they plug holes really well. It's something that I, I recommend to every contractor working in really rough conditions. It's very cheap insurance from having to face any downtime out in the field. So check that out. Talk to your lo local dealer if you need that, that uh, added to your tractor, but that's something we offer and the sealant we use is specially formulated for these jobs. The number two most important thing after tire pressure about operating the machine is understanding weight transfer. Weight transfer, the adjustment is located right here and it's a very small looking part of the machine but it impacts everything that you do. As you see now, weight transfer is in the setting zero which means it's totally off. It's having no effect on the machine whatsoever. To change this setting, you have to make sure that the hitch arms of the tractor are lifted completely up. So whether there's an attachment on or not, you can do it with an attachment on and move it down into these other settings. What weight transfer does is it physically engages with these different notches of the hitch arms. So when you're in the off setting, it's not doing anything out here. 
Um, but if you're all the way in the max setting, you are pulling back on these hitch arms with the spring that's located inside the chassis of the machine. And because of the geometry of those components, what that is doing is putting that weight and that ground pressure directly over the front axle of the machine. That is adding traction to the machine, and it's also making it easier to perform in tough conditions. So weight transfer is something that you want to use all the way on its max setting when you're mowing on a hillside because you want as much traction as possible. That's the most important thing, mowing on a hill. If you are mowing on a flat area and you want to have the most pronounced stripe, then you want weight transfer all the way off because you want the attachment contacting the ground with as much force as possible to bend that grass over. That's a good illustration to show that weight transfer isn't an easy button on or off in all situations. Weight transfer needs to be understood in that way and so that you know how to use it exactly depending on what job you're doing to get the most benefit. In each attachment operator's manual, you'll have recommendations for where the weight transfer should be set, but just know that having more weight transfer gives you better traction and better performance from the tractor, and having less weight transfer gives the attachment a better ability to work on the ground. Next, we're gonna move to some basic maintenance things that uh, are worth talking about. Again, like I said, we're not gonna go all the way in depth on all the maintenance this machine needs. That's another video for another time. So consult your owner's manual for that. But these are the couple things that are absolutely critical for daily operation. So the first thing is your radiator screen. This is your radiator screen. This one's brand new. Um, not much debris in here or anything. But what you'll notice when you are mowing is that the fan on the front side of this radiator pulling air through collects a lot of debris in this screen, and that's for a reason. That's so that you don't get it in the radiator itself. But it also means that you have to stop periodically and shake this out. So it's a pretty simple task. You just reach in, pull it out, shake it out, get all the grass and debris off the front side of it, and then put it back in. You'll notice that your temperature rating will start to climb excessively if you don't do this. And if ignored, you could potentially cause damage to the machine. Now, you'll get an audible warning and the tractor will start screaming at you if you let it go too far. So it's pretty hard to get this wrong and ignore it, but just know that that's where it's located. The more often you do that in really difficult conditions, the better. Where you'll see it plug up the fastest is when you're tough cutting late in the season uh, where there's been enough growth of those fibrous weed seeds uh, that get sucked in and just plug things up really quickly. This is the coolant overflow tank. So if you have to add coolant to your radiator, uh, you remove this bolt here and add it in this tank. That's obviously something that should be done cold, but something that you should probably check, if not daily, then, then pretty frequently just for operation of the machine. Next, we wanna talk about hydraulic oil level. I get this question a lot. Where do I add hydraulic oil to the tractor? It's inevitable that you'll lose some over time, whether it's through connecting to attachments and a little bit of oil loss in those connectors, or every time you hook up into a brand new attachment that requires a little bit of oil in the cylinders to fill itself, uh, there's, there's ways that the tractor depletes hydraulic oil. So if you start to get a little bit low and you need to add it, that's done right here. The tractor itself is acting as a reservoir in a lot of other ways, but this tank is where you add oil and it feeds the whole system. The thing is, there is no dipstick on this cap. That's usually the confusing part that people wanna know is how do I know when the level is right? The dipstick is actually this clear sight tube here. It is very difficult to get this to show up on camera, but there is an indicator on the inside of this hydraulic oil tank, and that is right next to the clear sight tube. So you'll compare where the level of the oil is inside the sight tube to the hash marks on the indicator, and that's what will set your level. There are a few things you have to do when you fill to this to make sure that you're not getting false readings, uh, namely, making sure that the front hitch arms are raised all the way, and if you have a rear three-point, that those hitch arms are on the ground. That gives you uh, the right capacity to um, make sure that the level is right on your tractor. And this isn't like millimeter level accuracy, so if you're out in the field and you're on the, on the low side of that uh, icon on the tank, that's not enough to end your day. The tractor has a very high volume of hydraulic oil inside of it, but just keep an eye on it and uh, make sure that you don't let that get too low over time. 
You have pretty easy access to the engine bay on a Ventrac. There's just two clips to undo and then you roll the hood up. Uh, so it is worthwhile sometimes to just open it up and take a quick visual inspection to make sure there's nothing packed in here. We work in a lot of dirty, dusty environments, so you can get leaves or debris or dust trapped in areas. Uh, so just taking a quick visual scan uh, and then if need be, blowing it out with a, with a backpack blower or something can help prolong the components inside the engine bay. No matter which engine you have in your 4520, all five of them fit in this same chassis but then the components look slightly different. So this being the Kubota gas EFI, you'll notice this tube is a little different. The exhaust setup is a little different. You actually have exhaust monitoring here. Um, but for the most part, if it's a liquid cooled engine, it'll all be the same layout. It'll be radiator right in front of the dash, then the engine, then PTO. Uh, and if it's an air cooled setup, this will just be a void because you won't have a radiator at all. Now we're gonna talk about the air filter. So this is pretty easy access here. Um, there's not a lot to say here about this other than this is your access point. Make sure you do this regularly and change those filters when appropriate. Moving to the back of the tractor, we have our fuel tank. So again, a very simple thing. Spin this cap off, refill your fuel in this area. Uh, we do make a diesel tractor, so don't make the mistake of putting gas in a diesel or diesel in a gas. Goes without saying. The critical thing here is just underneath the seat. This is your fuel shutoff. So this valve right here can be turned off to stop the flow from the tank. So if anyone has done that, then that may cause your machine to stall out or not start. But having this in the right position for run or storage. And then while we're here, I also wanna talk about another thing about starting. This is a battery cutoff switch. So what this does is kills all power to the machine. And it's actually pretty useful for storage. I use it myself when I'm not gonna use my tractor for a while. Uh, if I turn that switch off, that keeps the battery from draining as fast and it just stops anything from the, on the machine from being connected to it. So you'll see I got nothing at the key here, nothing's going to happen, but then flip this switch and we're live again. The big benefit to that yellow lever is that it's not a common thing to check for to start that machine. So aside from keeping the battery health in check, if you have any concern for maybe wandering eyes around your equipment or thieves kind of breaking into things. That's a great uh, tool that you can use to keep the machine kind of dead in the water. It works so effectively that I have loaned my tractor <laughs> to people before and told them that the switch is off. Like they've, they've come to my house to use it. And I said, hey, the switch is off. I've described where it is and everything. And I still get the phone call. Hey, why won't this thing start? So it does an incredible job. Uh, to the unknowing person of keeping the machine from running. Uh, so hopefully there's no thieves watching this video. If there are, then get a life. I don't know. <laughs> and the last maintenance item that I wanna talk about that comes into play on a daily, weekly basis is the hydraulic oil cooler. That's a pretty critical part of the whole system. That cooler is located inside this cavity and then the fan is back here on the back right side of the tractor. What you need to do is remove these four bolts. This panel slides away and it gives you access inside to easily clean that area. And so you need to do that to blow out all the debris, get rid of any dirt and chaff that's in there. And that keeps your hydraulic oil temps running cooler and something that needs to be uh, monitored over the life of the machine. Make sure you take care of that. Don't let that get out of hand. Now we're gonna talk about another great tip to get the most out of your machine while you're operating it and that is using OEM parts. So you can sign off from the video if you don't believe a thing that any OEM ever says, uh, but trust me on this one, you are going to want to listen to this. Do not use ever, under any circumstance, auto parts store belts. <laughs> the most common request or complaint that we get from customers in the field is of belt breakage. And I'd say at least half the time, if not more, we dive into it and it's a really quick, simple fix. It's, oh, I'm not using OEM belts. And on our machine specifically, that's very, very critical. We spec belts that are of the absolute highest quality and that goes even beyond ratings. So a belt that we have as a drive belt on a demanding attachment might even stack up technically identical to some rated belts that are uh, sourced from industrial applications somewhere else. 
and even those won't be as good because we've gone through the effort of testing every belt that exists for that application and picking the absolute best one even beyond that. So don't go to an auto parts store or just any random supplier and think, it, and think that because the belt is the same size, that's exactly what you need. What you'll notice is that those belts stretch, crack, and break much easier than our factory belts. Something like a tough cut where it's really demanding application, I can get a belt to last for months there, maybe even a year or more if I'm not doing work all the time. Uh, but an auto parts store belt, I can shred in minutes. Like even if I'm babying the machine, it takes almost no time at all. That's the first one. I'll get off my pedestal there, uh, but belts are really important to us. So just you know, make sure you run the right ones. You'll actually save yourself money in the long run buying the ones that are a little more expensive from us. Um, they're more expensive because they're actually worth it. Beyond that, other OEM components are also important. So hydraulic oil specifically and engine oil, we spec those because we know exactly what our tractor needs in demanding applications. It's the only way we can be certain about honoring machine warranties and things like that. So if you decide to put generic hydraulic oil through your machine from who knows what, what manufacturer, uh, and, and that comes out on the warranty process where there's some hydraulic component that's in question, then we're not gonna be able to honor that warranty. So trust me on this, the best thing you can do is just run parts and, and fluids that we know that we have certified to be genuine and to work for this machine. It's nearly everything we do is a high demand application and it requires that stuff to be performing at the highest level. And of course, those statements cascade into all of the other parts of the machine. Air filters come to mind, but even small stuff like little brackets and hardware, generally speaking, even the little things, we've taken great care in specking what actually works. And we are really truly not here when it comes to parts. We're not here to shark more money from you. Uh, we wanna make your life easier. That's the way to do it. You'll have less headaches. You'll just ask me less questions about why this thing broke and it shouldn't have uh, if you run OEM stuff. All right, now we're gonna look at the back of the machine and we're gonna talk three point hitch. So the back of a Ventrac doesn't get a lot of attention. Uh, because we focus all of our high demand applications up front, but it is worth talking about because we do have some options back here that you need to understand. So, you know, roughly half the tractors get three point hitches. Uh, it's not at all like standard compact tractors where they all have a three point hitch standard. Uh, this is an option for our machine because we don't have a shaft drive PTO, so it's really not used for that many things. This is going to be a kind of a lifting and moving and carrying attachment more than it is a functional work attachment. So that's the first question we get from people who don't have Ventrac yet, is what about a rear PTO? First of all, we don't have one. We can't get it to come through the center of the machine with the flex frame uh, and the engine being up front. There's not a logical way to make that work with it being cost effective in any way, shape or form. And we really prefer running everything on the front anyway. So we've just avoided it for as long as we've existed. But let's talk about why we do have it. So this is a standard category one three point hitch. Any category one attachments will go on this. And anything that doesn't have a PTO could be used. We do have these two hydraulic accessory circuits. So these are not high flow. These will not run any spinning drive motors or anything that takes a high gallon per minute rate of hydraulic flow. But what they will do is actuate cylinders. So in our application where you'll see this is sometimes we'll run like a blade on the back and a trencher on the front. The trencher does the work up front where the operator can watch it and doesn't have to turn his neck around. And then the blade being on the back, it's pretty simple work to close that trench back up so they can just drop it in and you can make all those adjustments, angle and stuff with the Ventrac um, and the levers up front. So the levers to control the three point are over here on the right. It's these three levers. They raise and lower the hitch arms. They actuate the two hydraulic uh, circuits on the rear. And when you're back here, you'll get this turnbuckle standard but we do offer a hydraulic top link and that can be plumbed to one of these circuits. The most common application for using a three point on a Ventrac is to use our three in one hitch system, which converts it to a Ventrac hitch arm. So grab my trusty hitch arms here again. And what you'll see then is on one side, the three in one hitch is a standard category one mount. So it mounts just like a three point attachment on any standard tractor and then it actually houses a set of these hitch arms inside the three in one. So then you can carry Ventrac attachments on the back of this. And if they're non PTO, they can actually work. If they are PTO, then you can use it as a carry all to just transport out to do field work. 
And then there is a float position for the hitch arms on the three-point itself if you are using an attachment that needs to follow the ground. All right, now we are on to the supporting cast. This is basically the extra fluff. Uh, some of this stuff may not even apply to you depending on the model of 4520 that you have. But we'll start with the steering cylinder. That is going to apply to every model. That's down here. And this is the single cylinder responsible for steering the entire tractor. You notice there's three holes here. That is for a reason. This changes the steering radius of the tractor. The inside hole is the tightest steering radius. You will only be able to use that with single wheels on the machine and no cab. The center position is for when you add duels. If you don't change the cylinder, then the outer duels will actually touch when you turn all the way full lock. So center position for duels, outer position for a cab, because the cab gets really close to the front of the machine, so it needs to limit that steering radius even tighter. Just remember that's something that needs to be adjusted depending on what you're using. Now you can use it in the less aggressive positions, so if you had single wheels on and you were in the dual wheel position, that would work okay. It just wouldn't turn as sharp. Okay, next we want to talk about fuse box locations. So pretty standard stuff here. If you have a, a single function not working, there are areas you can check. You can check your operator's manual to look at the schematics and see what is housed in each one of these fuse locations. That way you're prepared for in the future. If a specific function is not working, you know which location to check first. All right, this tip is for specifically the gas Kubota models that are carbureted. Uh, they have a choke cable right here to the right of the parking brake, and you must use that choke to start those engines, even if it's 95 degrees out and the machine was just running five minutes ago. It's not like choke in the standard sense where it's only needed if it's cold or it hasn't been run in a while. For whatever reason, that's just the way that engine is. So if you're turning that engine over and just turn it over, turn it over, turn it over, turn it over, nothing's happening, then try pulling that choke out just ever so slightly for a little bit while you're turning it over, push it back in, and you should be good to go. Uh, the other engines in the line do not exhibit that necessity, but that's one to know. So if you have that engine or you have a new operator getting onto that engine, uh, that's something you're gonna have to do to get it started. And of course, we do have the diesel model as well, so make sure you prime those glow plugs before you try to start that machine. That will make that easier and make you so that you can start working faster. The last thing I want to talk about are tie down points. So specifically of the tractor, but since we have an attachment on, we can throw that in as well. The tractor has specific tie down points front and rear and places that are okay and aren't okay <laughs> to strap the machine down. I have seen photos of a vent track before on a trailer with a strap over the hood. Don't do that, <laughs> please. Uh, for the sake of, of you as much as me and everybody else, don't do that. The tie down points on the tractor itself are located on the hitch arms. So let me grab these again. These hooks right here are a standard large tie down size. So you can hook on and tie down from both corners. For tractors prior to the 4520, you'll have to use the horizontal bar near the front transaxle to tie the front half of the machine down. On the attachments themselves, we often have specific tie down points on this power rake, you'll see those tie down points right here in the front. In the center of the machine, like I said, you can tie down straight across that tunnel. So right here in the middle of where your, your feet sit, this is structure that can support that. So you can take a strap straight over the center of this machine and tie down there. And then in the back of the machine, there's a bar that goes right across on the back part of the frame underneath the two inch receiver. That bar right there is an official tie down point and you can connect to that to pull the machine down. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching this whole video about operating your Ventrac 4520. Because this machine is very unique, it does take a certain level of operator awareness to get the most out of the machine. And that's what we want for all of you operators out there. So take some time, read the manuals through, and if you have any questions, please revisit this video to check out different sections on things you may have missed or things that you can pick up on in the future. Uh, we aim to make this an accessible machine that everybody can get a lot of work and productivity out of and understanding how it operates is the first part in that process. So thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.